in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. On the piece of land known as Easter Island, now a territory of Chile, stand several hundred massive stone monoliths. These carvings, called moai, are recognizable by their oversized heads. With their heavy brows, long noses, elongated ears, and protruding lips. While they average 4 meters in height and 12.5 tons. The largest is almost 10 meters tall and the heaviest weighs a full 86 tons. The upright sculptures are scattered around Easter Island, many installed on platforms called AHU along the coast. While others are more inland and several stand near the main volcanic quarry of Rano Raraku. The Rapa Nui people of the island built a total of 887 of these impressive statues between the 12th and 16th centuries. They were, it is said, symbols of religious and political authority. Embodiments of powerful chiefs or ancestors which faced inland toward the island's villages, perhaps watching over their creators, keeping them safe. While the very creation of such monoliths, most out of volcanic ash with stone hand chisels, is an impressive feat. What is more remarkable, not to mention mysterious, is how they were transported to their resting places. In the past, most researchers associated the building and transportation of the Moai with widespread deforestation on the island and eventual collapse of the Rapa Nui civilization. This hypothesis is based, in part, on the fact that the pollen record suddenly disappears at the same time as the Rapa Nui people stop constructing the Moai and transporting them with the help of wooden logs. How exactly would logs facilitate the movement of the statues? Most proponents of this method believe that the people created rollers by arranging parallel logs on which the prone statues were pulled or pushed. They would not have required an entire roadway of logs, since logs from the back could be placed at the front, creating a moving platform of sorts. To make it easier to roll and keep in position, the statue would be placed on two logs arranged in a V-shape. One proponent of this idea of rolling the statues in a prone position is Joanne Van Tilburg of UCLA. Van Tilburg created sophisticated computer models that took into account available materials, roots, rock, and manpower, even factoring in how much the workers would have to have eaten. Her models supported the idea that rolling prone statues was the most efficient method. As further evidence, Van Tilburg oversaw the movement of a Moai replica by the method she had proposed. They were successful, but evidence that it was possible is not necessarily evidence that it actually happened. Van Tilburg was not the only one to have experimented with rolling the statues. In the 1980s, archaeologist Charles Love experimented with rolling the Moai in an upright position, rather than prone, on two wooden runners. Indeed, a team of just 25 men was able to move the statue a distance of 150 feet in a mere two minutes. However, the route from the stone quarries where the statues were built to the coast where they were installed was often uneven, and Love's experiments were hampered by the tendency of the statues to tip over. While Love's ideas were dismissed by many, the idea of the statutes tipping over along the route was consistent with the many moai found on their sides or faces beside the island's ancient roads. And local legend held that the statues walked to their destinations, which would seem to support an upright mode of transportation. In fact, rolling was not the only possible way of transporting the moai in an upright position. In the 1980s, Pavel Pavel and Thor Heyerdahl had experimented with swiveling the statues forward. With one rope tied around the head and another around the base, they were able to move a 5-ton moai with only 8 people, and a 9-ton statue with 16. However, they abandoned their efforts when their technique proved too damaging, as they shuffled the statues forward, the bases were chipped away. This confounding factor led most to believe that an upright, rope-assisted walking method was incorrect. But many now believe that they were, in fact, transported upright. 
In 2012, Carl Lipo of California State University Long Beach and Terry Hunt of the University of Hawaii teamed up with archaeologist Sergio Rapu to refine the upright walking idea. They found that the statues that appeared to be abandoned in transit had bases with a curved front edge. This meant they would naturally topple forward and would need to be modified once they reached their destinations. But that curved edge also meant that they could easily be rocked forward using a small team of people and three ropes attached to the head. Indeed, their experiments demonstrated the feasibility of this method, and their theory has. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is known as one of the most important and controversial scientific theories ever published. Darwin was an English scientist in the 19th century best known for his book, On the Origin of Species. In his book, Darwin postulated different species shared characteristics of common ancestors. That they branched off from common ancestors as they evolved, and that new traits and characteristics were a result of natural selection. The theory is based on the assumptions that life developed from non-life and progressed and evolved in an indirect manner. Therefore, the theory of evolution, while controversial, has shaped and influenced the modern scientific world's thinking on the development of life itself. Darwin was born February 12, 1809 in England. Although initially entering into medicine, Darwin chose to pursue his interest in natural science and embarked on a five-year journey aboard the HMS Beagle, a British sloop belonging to the Royal Navy. Because of his experience aboard the Beagle, he laid the foundation for his theory of evolution while also establishing himself within the scientific community. Specifically, Darwin's keen observation of the fossils and wildlife he saw during his time on the Beagle served as the basis for the cornerstone of his theory, natural selection. Natural selection contributes to the basis of Darwin's theory of evolution. One of the core tenets of Darwin's theory is that more offspring are always produced for a species than can possibly survive. Yet, no two offspring are perfectly alike. As a result, through random mutation and genetic drift, over time offspring develop new traits and characteristics. Over time beneficial traits and characteristics that promote survival will be kept in the gene pool while those that harm survival will be selected against. Therefore, this natural selection ensures that a species gradually improves itself over an extended duration of time. On the other hand, as a species continues to improve itself, it branches out to create entirely new species that are no longer capable of reproducing together. Through natural selection, organisms could branch off of each other and evolve to the point where they no longer belong to the same species. Consequently, simple organisms evolve into more complex and different organisms as species break away from one another. Natural selection parallels selective breeding employed by humans on domesticated animals for centuries. Namely, horse breeders will ensure that horses with particular characteristics, such as speed and endurance, are allowed to produce offspring while horses that do not share those above-average traits will not. Therefore, over several generations, the new offspring will already be predisposed towards being excellent racing horses. Darwin's theory is that selective breeding occurs in nature as natural selection is the engine behind evolution. Thus, the theory provides an excellent basis for understanding how organisms change over time. Nevertheless, it is just a theory and elusively difficult to prove. One of the major holes in Darwin's theory revolves around irreducibly complex systems. An irreducibly complex system is known as a system where many different parts must all operate together. As a result, in the absence of one, the system as a whole collapses. Consequently, as modern technology improves, science can identify these irreducibly complex systems, even at microscopic levels. 
These complex systems, if so inter-reliant, would be resistant to Darwin's supposition of how evolution occurs. As Darwin himself admitted, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivance for adjusting the focus for different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I free confess, absurd in the highest degree. In conclusion, On the Origin of Species is known as one of the most consequential books ever published. Darwin's theory of evolution remains, to this day, a lightning rod for controversy. The theory can be observed repeatedly, but never proven, and there are a plethora of instances that cast doubt on the processes of natural selection and evolution. Darwin's conclusions were a result of keen observation and training as a naturalist. Despite the controversy that swirls around his theory, Darwin remains one of the most influential scientists and naturalists ever born due to his theory of evolution. While the use of stone tools began 2.5 million years ago, it wasn't until about 10,000 BCE that Homo sapiens applied these tools to the deliberate cultivation of plants and animals. The adoption of sustained agriculture, what anthropologists call the Neolithic Revolution, signifies an important turning point in the development of human societies. As it led directly to population growth, permanent or semi-permanent settlement, as well as technological and social development. Neolithic agriculture developed at different times in different parts of the world, beginning with the Levant and Mesopotamia, followed by Northern Africa, Southeast Asia, and Europe. But while we often call it a revolution, it would be a mistake to believe that agriculture was a sudden and complete development. An all-or-nothing proposition that societies adopted wholesale at the first opportunity. Instead, it developed slowly, beginning as a supplement to more traditional hunting and gathering lifestyles in which people relied on plants and animals gathered or hunted in their natural environment. Over time, as people learned more about and relied more greatly on domesticated plants and animals, they settled more permanently and cultivated the land more intensively. Neolithic farmers collected and planted seeds that they learned would produce palatable grains, selectively breeding plants that were deemed healthy and delicious, and avoiding those that were not. Early agriculture was restricted to a limited number of plants, namely emmer wheat, einkorn wheat, and barley. Later, people learned to cultivate pulses, including lentils, peas, chickpeas, and bitter vetch, as well as the multi-purpose flax plant. Together, these eight plant species are known as the Neolithic founder crops or primary domesticates. People's success in planting, cultivating, and harvesting these plants came about as a result not only of their increased knowledge of the plants themselves but also of the conditions for growth. They explored innovative irrigation techniques, which enabled even greater production and, eventually, food surpluses. Of course, food surpluses are useless unless people have the ability and facilities to store them, which people did in granaries. And food surpluses, in turn, enabled a host of other social developments. Like occupational specialization, since not everyone had to be involved in food production, trade, and social stratification. These advances in agriculture went hand in hand with technological development. People fashioned stone tools such as hoes for working soil, sickle blades for harvesting the crops, and grinding stones for processing the grains. More important than such agricultural implements, however, was the polished stone axe, which allowed the Neolithic farmers to clear forests on a large scale and open up new lands for cultivation. Along with the adze, the axe also enabled them to work the trees they felled into wood that was usable for building shelter and other structures. Besides cultivating plants, these Stone Age farmers also domesticated animals. At first, it was sheep, goats, and dogs whose temperament, 
diet, and mating patterns made them good candidates for domestication. Later, cows and pigs were added to the mix. Besides meat, these animals provided people with milk, a renewable source of protein, leather, wool, and fertilizer. Cows became valued for their labor. As they assisted with plowing and towing, and dogs provided protection, not only to humans but also to their crops and livestock, as well as companionship. That agriculture enabled hitherto unknown population growth is undeniable. Food surpluses and an agricultural lifestyle brought a security and safety that nomadic hunter-gatherers did not enjoy. And it may be argued that the subsequent advances in all realms of society, not only the aforementioned technology but also knowledge, art, writing, astronomy, would not have emerged without a sedentary lifestyle. But the impact of the Neolithic Revolution, often heralded as a giant step forward for humankind, was not all positive. Sedentary agriculture narrowed the diet of Neolithic peoples, they consumed greater amounts of starch and plant protein and fewer types of food overall. An increasing number of researchers are claiming that human nutrition became worse with the Neolithic Revolution. In addition, disease increased. As humans lived in closer contact with each other and with domesticated animals, sanitation didn't advance quite as quickly as agricultural methods. It also turns out that agriculture required significantly more labor than hunting and gathering. The combined result of these facts was a life expectancy that was most likely shorter than that of the apparently more primitive hunter-gatherers. The human brain is a complex organ that is still not fully understood by scientists. It is responsible for all our thoughts, emotions, and actions, and it is constantly processing vast amounts of information from our senses. Over the past century, researchers have made great strides in unraveling some of the mysteries of the brain, but there is still much that remains unknown. One area of the brain that has received a lot of attention in recent years is the prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain is located at the front of the cerebral hemispheres. And it is involved in a wide range of cognitive functions, including decision-making, working memory, and attention control. Studies have shown that the prefrontal cortex is also involved in a number of social and emotional processes, such as empathy and self-awareness. Despite its importance, the prefrontal cortex is also one of the most vulnerable regions of the brain. It is especially susceptible to damage from traumatic brain injuries, strokes, and certain psychiatric disorders. Damage to the prefrontal cortex can lead to a range of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral problems, such as impaired decision-making, reduced self-control, and altered social behavior. One of the challenges in studying the prefrontal cortex is that it is not a single, uniform structure. Instead, it is composed of a number of different regions that each have their own distinct functions and connections to other parts of the brain. Researchers have used a variety of techniques to map these regions and to investigate their roles in different cognitive and emotional processes. One technique that has been used to study the prefrontal cortex is functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI. This method allows researchers to visualize changes in blood flow to different regions of the brain in response to specific stimuli or tasks. By analyzing these patterns of activation, researchers can gain insights into how different regions of the prefrontal cortex contribute to different cognitive and emotional processes. Another technique that has been used to study the prefrontal cortex is transcranial magnetic stimulation TMS. This method involves using a magnetic field to stimulate specific regions of the brain and temporarily disrupt their function. By selectively disrupting different regions of the prefrontal cortex, researchers can gain insights into the roles that these regions play in various cognitive and emotional processes. Despite the progress that has been made in understanding the prefrontal cortex, there is still much that remains unknown. 
Researchers continue to investigate the roles that different regions of the prefrontal cortex play in various cognitive and emotional processes. And they are also exploring new methods for studying the brain, such as optogenetics, which involves using light to selectively activate or deactivate neurons in the brain. No student of a foreign language needs to be told that grammar is complex. By changing word sequences and by adding a range of auxiliary verbs and suffixes, we are able to communicate tiny variations in meaning. We can turn a statement into a question. State whether an action has taken place or is soon to take place, and perform many other word tricks to convey subtle differences in meaning. Nor is this complexity inherent to the English language. All languages, even those of so-called primitive, tribes have clever grammatical components. The Cherokee pronoun system, for example, can distinguish between you and I, several other people and I, and you, another person and I. In English, all these meanings are summed up in the one, crude pronoun, we. Grammar is universal and plays a part in every language, no matter how widespread it is. So the question which has baffled many linguists is, who created grammar? At first, it would appear that this question is impossible to answer. To find out how grammar is created, someone needs to be present at the time of a language's creation, documenting its emergence. Many historical linguists are able to trace modern complex languages back to earlier languages, but in order to answer the question of how complex languages are actually formed, the researcher needs to observe how languages are started from scratch. Amazingly, however, this is possible. Some of the most recent languages evolved due to the Atlantic slave trade. At that time, Slaves from a number of different ethnicities were forced to work together under colonizers' rule. Since they had no opportunity to learn each other's languages, they developed a makeshift language called a pidgin. Pidgins are strings of words copied from the language of the landowner. They have little in the way of grammar. And in many cases it is difficult for a listener to deduce when an event happened, and who did what to whom. A. Speakers need to use circumlocution in order to make their meaning understood. B. Interestingly, however, all it takes for a pigeon to become a complex language is for a group of children to be exposed to it at the time when they learn their mother tongue. C. Slave children did not simply copy the strings of words uttered by their elders, they adapted their words to create a new, expressive language. D. Complex grammar systems which emerge from pigeons are termed creoles, and they are invented by children. Further evidence of this can be seen in studying sign languages for the deaf. Sign languages are not simply a series of gestures, they utilize the same grammatical machinery that is found in spoken languages. Moreover, there are many different languages used worldwide. The creation of one such language was documented quite recently in Nicaragua. Previously, all deaf people were isolated from each other, but in 1979 a new government introduced schools for the deaf. Although children were taught speech and lip reading in the classroom, in the playgrounds they began to invent their own sign system, using the gestures that they used at home. It was basically a pigeon. Each child used the signs differently, and there was no consistent grammar. However, children who joined the school later, when this inventive sign system was already around, developed a quite different sign language. Although it was based on the signs of the older children, the younger children's language was more fluid and compact, and it utilized a large range of grammatical devices to clarify meaning. What is more, all the children use the signs in the same way. A new creole was born. Some linguists believe that many of the world's most established languages were creoles at first. The English past tense ed ending may have evolved from the verb, do. It ended, may once have been, it ended. Therefore it would appear that even the most widespread languages were partly created by children. 
Children appear to have innate grammatical machinery in their brains, which springs to life when they are first trying to make sense of the world around them. Their minds can serve to create logical, complex structures even when there is no grammar present for them to copy. The next few decades will see great changes in the way energy is supplied and used. In some major oil-producing nations, peak oil has already been reached and there are increasing fears of global warming. Consequently, many countries are focusing on the switch to a low-carbon economy. This transition will lead to major changes in the supply and use of electricity. A. Firstly, there will be an increase in overall demand. As consumers switch from oil and gas to electricity to power their homes and vehicles. B. Secondly, there will be an increase in power generation, not only in terms of how much is generated, but also how it is generated, as there is growing electricity generation from renewable sources. C. To meet these challenges, countries are investing in smart grid technology. D. This system aims to provide the electricity industry with a better understanding of power generation and demand, and to use this information to create a more efficient power network. Smart grid technology basically involves the application of a computer system to the electricity network. The computer system can be used to collect information about supply and demand and improve engineers' ability to manage the system. With better information about electricity demand, the network will be able to increase the amount of electricity delivered per unit generated, leading to potential reductions in fuel needs and carbon emissions. Moreover, the computer system will assist in reducing operational and maintenance costs. Smart grid technology offers benefits to the consumer too. They will be able to collect real-time information on their energy use for each appliance. Varying tariffs throughout the day will give customers the incentive to use appliances at times when supply greatly exceeds demand, leading to great reductions in bills. For example, they may use their washing machines at night. Smart meters can also be connected to the internet or telephone system, allowing customers to switch appliances on or off remotely. Furthermore, if houses are fitted with the apparatus to generate their own power, appliances can be set to run directly from the on-site power source, and any excess can be sold to the grid. With these changes comes a range of challenges. The first involves managing the supply and demand. Sources of renewable energy, such as wind, wave and solar, are notoriously unpredictable. And nuclear power, which is also set to increase as nations switch to alternative energy sources, is inflexible. With oil and gas, it is relatively simple to increase the supply of energy to match the increasing demand during peak times of the day or year. With alternative sources, this is far more difficult, and may lead to blackouts or system collapse. Potential solutions include investigating new and efficient ways to store energy and encouraging consumers to use electricity at off-peak times. A second problem is the fact that many renewable power generation sources are located in remote areas, such as windy uplands and coastal regions. Where there is currently a lack of electrical infrastructure, new infrastructures therefore must be built. Thankfully, with improved smart technology, this can be done more efficiently by reducing the reinforcement or construction costs. Although smart technology is still in its infancy, pilot schemes to promote and test it are already underway. Consumers are currently testing the new smart meters which can be used in their homes to manage electricity use. There are also a number of demonstrations being planned to show how the smart technology could practically work, and trials are in place to test the new electrical infrastructure. It is likely that technology will be added in layers, starting with quick WN methods which will provide initial carbon savings, to be followed by more advanced systems at a later date. Cities are prime candidates for investment into smart energy, due to the high population density and high energy use.
It is here where smart technology is likely to be promoted first. Utilizing a range of sustainable power sources, transport solutions and an infrastructure for charging electrically powered vehicles. The infrastructure is already changing fast. By the year 2050, changes in the energy supply will have transformed our homes, our roads and our behavior. Humans are uniquely smart among all the other species on the planet. We are capable of outstanding feats of technology and engineering. Then why are we so prone to making mistakes? And why do we tend to make the same ones time and time again? When primate psychologist Lori Santos from the Comparative Cognition Lab at Yale University posed this question to her team. They were thinking in particular of the errors of judgment which led to the recent collapse of the financial markets. Santos came to two possible answers to this question. Either humans have designed environments which are too complex for us to fully understand, or we are biologically prone to making bad decisions. In order to test these theories, the team selected a group of brown capuchin monkeys. Monkeys were selected for the test because, as distant relatives of humans, they are intelligent and have the capacity to learn. However, they are not influenced by any of the technological or cultural environments which affect human decision-making. The team wanted to test whether the capuchin monkeys, when put into similar situations as humans, would make the same mistakes. A of particular interest to the scientists was whether monkeys would make the same mistakes when making financial decisions. B in order to find out, they had to introduce the monkeys to money. C the monkeys soon cottoned on and as well as learning simple exchange techniques were soon able to distinguish bargains if one team member offered two grapes in exchange for a metal disc and another team member offered one grape the monkeys chose the two grape option d interestingly when the data about the monkeys purchasing strategies was compared with economists data on human behavior there was a perfect match so after establishing that the monkey market was operating effectively, the team decided to introduce some problems which humans generally get wrong. One of these issues is risk-taking. Imagine that someone gave you $1,000. In addition to this $1,000, you can receive either A, an additional $500 or B. Someone tosses a coin and if it lands heads, you receive an additional $1,000. But if it lands tails, you receive no more money. Of these options, most people tend to choose option A. They prefer guaranteed earnings, rather than running the risk of receiving nothing. Now imagine a second situation in which you are given $2,000. Now, you can choose to either A. Lose $500, leaving you with a total of $1,500, or B. Toss a coin. If it lands heads, you lose nothing. But if it lands tails, you lose $1,000, leaving you with only $1,000. Interestingly, when we stand to lose money, we tend to choose the more risky choice, option B. And as we know from the experience of financial investors and gamblers, it is unwise to take risks when we are on a losing streak. So would the monkeys make the same basic error of judgment? The team put them to the test by giving them similar options. In the first test, monkeys had the option of exchanging their disc for one grape and receiving one bonus grape. Or exchanging the disc for one grape and sometimes receiving two bonus grapes and sometimes receiving no bonus. It turned out that monkeys, like humans, chose the less risky option in times of plenty. Then the experiment was reversed. Monkeys were offered three grapes, but in option A were only actually given two grapes. In option B, they had a 50-50 chance of receiving all three grapes or one grape only. The results were that monkeys, like humans, take more risks in times of loss. The implications of this experiment are that because monkeys make the same irrational judgments that humans do, 
Maybe human error is not a result of the complexity of our financial institutions, but is embedded in our evolutionary history. If this is the case, our errors of judgment will be very difficult to overcome. On a more optimistic note however, humans are fully capable of overcoming limitations once we have identified them. By recognizing them, we can design technologies which will help us to make better choices in future. There has, in recent years, been an outpouring of information about the impact of buildings on the natural environment, information which explains and promotes green and sustainable construction design, strives to convince others of its efficacy and warns of the dangers of ignoring the issue. Seldom do these documents offer any advice to practitioners, such as those designing mechanical and electrical systems for a building, on how to utilize this knowledge on a practical level. While the terms green and sustainable are often considered synonymous, in that they both symbolize nature, green does not encompass all that is meant by sustainability, which can be defined as minimizing the negative impacts of human activities on the natural environment, in particular those which have long-term and irreversible effects. Some elements of green design may be sustainable too, for example those which reduce energy usage and pollution, while others, such as ensuring internal air quality, may be considered green despite having no influence on the ecological balance. Although there are a good many advocates of green construction in the architectural industry, able to cite ample reasons why buildings should be designed in a sustainable way, not to mention a plethora of architectural firms with experience in green design. This is not enough to make green construction come into being. The driving force behind whether a building is constructed with minimal environmental impact lies with the owner of the building. That is, the person financing the project. If the owner considers green design unimportant, or of secondary importance, then more than likely, it will not be factored into the design. The commissioning process plays a key role in ensuring the owner gets the building he wants, in terms of design, costs and risk. At the pre-design stage, the owner's objectives, criteria and the type of design envisaged are discussed and documented. This gives a design team a solid foundation on which they can build their ideas, and also provides a specific benchmark against which individual elements, such as costs, design and environmental impact can be judged. Owners who skip the commissioning process, or fail to take green issues into account when doing so, often come a cropper once their building is up and running. Materials and equipment are installed as planned and, at first glance, appear to fulfill their purpose adequately. However, in time, the owner realizes that operational and maintenance costs are higher than necessary, and that the occupants are dissatisfied with the results. These factors in turn lead to higher ownership costs as well as increased environmental impact. In some cases, an owner may be aware of the latest trends in sustainable building design. He may have done research into it himself, or he may have been informed of the merits of green design through early discussion with professionals. However, Firms should not take it as read that someone commissioning a building already has a preconceived idea of how green he intends the structure to be. Indeed, this initial interaction between owner and firm is the ideal time for a designer to outline and promote the ways that green design can meet the client's objectives. Thus turning a project originally not destined for green design into a potential candidate. Typically, when considering whether or not to adopt a green approach, an owner will ask about additional costs, return for investment and to what extent green design should be the limiting factor governing decisions in the design process. 1. Many of these costs are incurred by the increased cooperation between the various stakeholders, such as the owner, the design professionals, contractors and end-users. 2. However, 
In green design, they must be involved from the outset, since green design demands interaction between these disciplines. 3. This increased coordination clearly requires additional expenditure. 4. A client may initially balk at these added fees, and may require further convincing of the benefits if he is to proceed. It is up to the project team to gauge the extent to which a client wants to get involved in a green design project and provide a commensurate service. Of course, there may be financial advantage for the client in choosing a greener design. Case studies cite examples of green, sustainable designs which have demonstrated lower costs for long-term operation, ownership and even construction. Tax credits and rebates are usually available on a regional basis for projects with sustainable design or low emissions, among others. Anthropology distinguishes itself from the other social sciences by its greater emphasis on fieldwork as the source of new knowledge. The aim of such studies is to develop as intimate an understanding as possible of the phenomena investigated. Although the length of field studies varies from a few weeks to years, it is generally agreed that anthropologists should stay in the field long enough for their presence to be considered natural by the permanent residents. Realistically, however, anthropologists may never reach this status. Their foreign mannerisms make them appear clownish, and so they are treated with curiosity and amusement. If they speak the local language at all, they do so with a strange accent and flawed grammar. They ask tactless questions and inadvertently break rules regarding how things are usually done. Arguably this could be an interesting starting point for research, though it is rarely exploited. Otherwise, anthropologists take on the role of the superior expert. In which case they are treated with deference and respect, only coming into contact with the most high-ranking members of the society. Anthropologists with this role may never witness the gamut of practices which take place in all levels of the society. No matter which role one takes on, anthropologists generally find fieldwork extremely demanding. Anthropological texts may read like an exciting journey of exploration, but rarely is this so. Long periods of time spent in the field are generally characterized by boredom, illness and frustration. Anthropologists in the field encounter unfamiliar climates, strange food and low standards of hygiene. It is often particularly trying for researchers with middle-class, European backgrounds to adapt to societies where being alone is considered pitiful. It takes a dedicated individual to conduct research which is not in some way influenced by these personal discomforts. Nonetheless, Fieldwork requires the researcher to spend as much time as possible in local life. A range of research methodologies can be utilized to extract information. 1. These can be classified as emic or etic. 2. While emic descriptions are considered more desirable nowadays, they are difficult to attain. Even if the researcher does his utmost to reproduce the facts from the native's point of view, 3. More often than not, aspects of the researcher's own culture. Perspective and literary style seep into the narrative. Moreover, research generally involves translations from one language to another and from speech into writing. In doing this, the meaning of utterances is changed. 4. The only truly emic descriptions can be those given by the natives themselves in their own vernacular. The least invasive type of research methodology is observation. Here, the researcher studies the group and records findings without intruding too much on their privacy. This is not to say, however, that the presence of the researcher will have minimal impact on the findings. An example was Richard Borchet Lee, who, in studying local groups in the Kalahari refused to provide the people with food so as not to taint his research leading to an inevitable hostility towards the researcher which would not otherwise have been present. A variant on the observation technique. Participant observation requires that the anthropologist not only observes the culture, but participates in it too. 
It allows for deeper immersion into the culture studied, hence a deeper understanding of it. By developing a deeper rapport with the people of the culture, it is hoped they will open up and divulge more about their culture and way of life than can simply be observed. Participant observation is still an imperfect methodology, however. Since populations may adjust their behavior around the researcher, knowing that they are the subject of research. The participatory approach was conceived in an attempt to produce as emic a perspective as possible. The process involves not just the gathering of information from local people, but involves them in the interpretation of the findings. That is, rather than the researcher getting actively involved in the processes within the local community, the process is turned on its head. The local community is actively involved in the research process. The craft of perfumery has an ancient and global heritage. The art flourished in ancient Rome, where the emperors were said to bathe in scent. After the fall of Rome, much of the knowledge was lost, but survived in Islamic civilizations in the Middle Ages. Arab and Persian pharmacists developed essential oils from the aromatic plants of the Indian Peninsula. They developed the processes of distillation and suspension in alcohol, which allowed for smaller amounts of raw materials to be used than in the ancient process, by which flower petals were soaked in warm oil. This knowledge was carried back to European monasteries during the Crusades. At first, the use of fragrances was primarily associated with healing. Aromatic alcoholic waters were ingested as well as used externally. Fragrances were used to purify the air, both for spiritual and health purposes. During the Black Death, the bubonic plague was thought to have resulted from a bad odor which could be averted by inhaling pleasant fragrances such as cinnamon. The Black Death led to an aversion to using water for washing. And so perfume was commonly used as a cleaning agent. Later on, the craft of perfume re-entered Europe and was centered in Venice. Chiefly because it was an important trade route and a center for glassmaking. Having such materials at hand was essential for the distillation process. In the late 17th century, Trade soared in France, when Louis XIV brought in policies of protectionism and patronage which stimulated the purchase of luxury goods. Here, perfumery was the preserve of glovemakers. The link arose since the tanning of leather required putrid substances. Consequently, the gloves were scented before they were sold and worn. A glove and perfume makers guild had existed here since 1190. Entering it required seven years of formal training under a master perfumer. The trade in perfume flourished during the reign of Louis XV. As the master glove and perfume makers, particularly those trading in Paris, received patronage from the royal court, where it is said that a different perfume was used each week. The perfumers diversified into other cosmetics including soaps, powders, white face paints and hair dyes. They were not the sole sellers of beauty products. Mercers, spicers, vinegar makers and wig makers were all cashing in on the popularity of perfumed products. Even simple shopkeepers were coming up with their own concoctions to sell. During the 18th century, more modern, capitalist perfume industry began to emerge, particularly in Britain where there was a flourishing consumer society. In France, the revolution initially disrupted the perfume trade due to its association with aristocracy, however. It regained momentum later as a wider range of markets were sought both in the domestic and overseas markets. The guild system was abolished in 1791, allowing new high-end perfumery shops to open in Paris. Perfume became less associated with health in 1810 with a Napoleonic ordinance which required perfumers to declare the ingredients of all products for internal consumption. Unwilling to divulge their secrets, traders concentrated on products for external use. Napoleon affected the industry in other ways too. 
With French ports blockaded by the British during the Napoleonic Wars, the London perfumers were able to dominate the markets for some time. One of the significant changes in the 19th century was the idea of branding. Until then, trademarks had had little significance in the perfumery where goods were consumed locally. Although they had a long history in other industries. One of the pioneers in this field was Rimmel who was nationalized as a British citizen in 1857. He took advantage of the spread of railroads to reach customers in wider markets. To do this, he built a brand which conveyed prestige and quality, and were worth paying a premium for. He recognized the role of design in enhancing the value of his products, hiring a French lithographer to create the labels for his perfume bottles. Luxury fragrances were strongly associated with the affluent and prestigious cities of London and Paris. Perfumers elsewhere tended to supply cheaper products and knockoffs of the London and Paris brands. The United States perfume industry, which developed around the docks in New York where French oils were being imported, began in this way. Many American firms were founded by immigrants, such as William Colgate, who arrived in 1806. At this time, Colgate was chiefly known as a perfumery. Its cashmere bouquet brand had 625 perfume varieties in the early 20th century. Science plays a crucial role in identifying problems related to how natural systems function and deteriorate, particularly when they are affected by an external factor. In turn, scientific findings shape the policies introduced to protect such systems where necessary. Experts are frequently called upon by politicians to provide evidence which can be used to make scientifically sound, or at least scientifically justifiable policy decisions. Issues arise as there are frequent disagreements between experts over the way data is gathered and interpreted. An example of the former is the first scientific evidence of a hole in the ozone layer by the British Antarctic Survey. 1. The findings were at first greeted by the scientific community with skepticism, as the British Antarctic Survey was not yet an established scientific community. 2. Moreover, it was generally believed that satellites would have picked up such ozone losses if they were indeed occurring. 3. It was not until the methodology of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center was reviewed that it became apparent that data had been overlooked. 4. With regards to the latter, controversy between scientists may arise where data analysis appears to support one policy over another. In 1991, the World Resource Institute WRI, published estimates of net emissions and sinks of greenhouse gases for a number of countries, including India. The report provoked criticisms among Indian scientists who argued that the figures had failed to take some significant factors into account, leading to overestimated emission values. The WRI was accused of blaming less economically developed countries for global warming, a stance which, if accepted, could impede industrialization and sustain, even widen, the wealth gap. Problems regarding the scientific method are well documented and it is widely accepted by the scientific community that, however consistent scientists are in their procedures. The results born under different circumstances can vary markedly. A number of factors influence research, among them the organization of a laboratory, the influence of prevailing theories, financial constraints and the peer review process. Consequently, scientists tend to believe they are not in a position to bear universal truths but to reveal tendencies. However, this is countered by two factors. Firstly, certain scientific institutions wish to maintain a degree of status as bearers of truth. Further, policymakers uphold this understanding by requesting scientific certainties in order to legitimize their policy decisions. According to a number of authors who have documented this process, decision makers do not necessarily try to obtain all the information which is or could be made available regarding an issue. Rather, 
They select that information which is necessary to fulfill their goals, information termed as path knowledge. Attempts to underplay transboundary issues such as water provision and pollution are cases in point. Politicians clearly cannot pretend that certain data do not exist if they are well known in scientific communities or national borders, but some discretion is evident. Especially where there is controversy and uncertainty. It is important to note that policies regarding scientific issues are influenced in no small part by societal factors. These include the relative importance of certain environmental issues, the degree of trust in the institutions conducting the research, and not least the social standing of those affected by the issue. In other words, environmental problems are in many ways socially constructed according to the prevailing cultural, economic and political conditions within a society. It has been suggested, for example, that contemporary post-materialist, Western societies pay greater attention to quality, including environmental quality, than quantity. This theory does not necessarily assume that people of low-income countries have no interest in environmental protection, as the example of the Chipko movement in India clearly demonstrates. But demonstrates that the way a resource is valued varies widely among different communities. Finally, it cannot be denied that the issue of the day changes constantly. One issue becomes more or less urgent than another, based on current events. Concurrently, new issues enter the political agenda. It has been noted that it often takes a policy entrepreneur, someone who dedicates time, energy and financial resources to a certain issue, to raise its profile. Furthermore, whether an issue is taken up by political, environmental or media groups depends very much on the degree to which it suits their particular agenda, not to mention budget. Chickenpox is a highly contagious infectious disease caused by the varicella zoster virus. Sufferers develop a fleeting itchy rash that can spread throughout the body. The disease can last for up to 14 days and can occur in both children and adults, though the young are particularly vulnerable. Individuals infected with chickenpox can expect to experience a high but tolerable level of discomfort and a fever as the disease works its way through the system. The ailment was once considered to be a rite of passage by parents in the U.S. and thought to provide children with greater and improved immunity to other forms of sickness later in life. This view, however, was altered after additional research by scientists demonstrated unexpected dangers associated with the virus. Over time, the fruits of this research have transformed attitudes toward the disease and the utility of seeking preemptive measures against it. A vaccine against chickenpox was originally invented by Michiaki Takahashi, a Japanese doctor and research scientist, in the mid-1960s. Dr. Takahashi began his work to isolate and grow the virus in 1965 and in 1972 began clinical trials with a live but weakened form of the virus that caused the human body to create antibodies. Japan and several other countries began widespread chickenpox vaccination programs in 1974. However, it took over 20 years for the chickenpox vaccine to be approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA, finally earning the U.S. government's seal of approval for widespread use in 1995. Yet even though the chickenpox vaccine was available and recommended by the FDA, parents did not immediately choose to vaccinate their children against this disease. Mothers and fathers typically cited the notion that chickenpox did not constitute a serious enough disease against which a person needed to be vaccinated. Strong belief in that view eroded when scientists discovered the link between varicella zoster, the virus that causes chickenpox, and shingles, a far more serious, harmful, and longer-lasting disease in older adults that impacts the nervous system. They reached the conclusion that varicella zoster remains dormant inside the body. 
making it significantly more likely for someone to develop shingles. As a result, the medical community in the U.S. encouraged the development, adoption, and use of a vaccine against chickenpox to the public. Although the appearance of chickenpox and shingles within one person can be many years apart, generally many decades, the increased risk in developing shingles as a younger adult, 30 to 40 years old rather, than 60 to 70 years old, proved to be enough to convince the medical community that immunization should be preferred to the traditional alternative. Another reason that the chickenpox vaccine was not immediately accepted and used by parents in the U.S. centered on observations made by scientists that the vaccine simply did not last long enough and did not confer a lifetime of immunity. In other words, scientists considered the benefits of the vaccine to be temporary when given to young children. They also feared that it increased the odds that a person could become infected with chickenpox later as a young adult. When the rash is more painful and prevalent and can last up to three or four weeks. Hence, allowing young children to develop chickenpox rather than take a vaccine against it was believed to be the lesser of two evils. This idea changed over time as booster shots of the vaccine elongated. Immunity encountered the perceived limits on the strength of the vaccine itself. Today, use of the chickenpox vaccine is common throughout the world. Pediatricians suggest an initial vaccination shot after a child turns one year old. With booster shots recommended after the child turns eight, the vaccine is estimated to be up to 90% effective and has reduced worldwide cases of chickenpox infection to 400,000 cases per year from over 4 million cases before vaccination became widespread. A. In light of such statistics, most doctors insist that the potential risks of developing shingles outweigh the benefits of avoiding rare complications associated with inoculations. B. Of course. Many parents continue to think of the disease as an innocuous ailment, refusing to take preemptive steps against it. C. As increasing numbers of children are vaccinated and the virus becomes increasingly rarer, however, even this trend among parents has failed to halt the decline of chickenpox among the most vulnerable populations. D. Deep in the Sierra Nevada, the famous General Grant giant sequoia tree is suffering its loss of stature in silence. What once was the world's no. Two biggest tree has been supplanted thanks to the most comprehensive measurements taken of the largest living things on earth. The new number two is the president. A 54,000 cubic foot gargantuan not far from the Grant in Sequoia National Park. After 3,240 years, the giant sequoia still is growing wider at a consistent rate, which may be what most surprised the scientists examining how the sequoias and coastal redwoods will be affected by climate change and whether these trees have a role to play in combating it. I consider it to be the greatest tree in all of the mountains of the world, said Stephen Sillett. A Redwood researcher whose team from Humboldt State University is seeking to mathematically assess the potential of California's iconic trees to absorb planet warming carbon dioxide. The researchers are a part of the 10-year Redwoods and Climate Change Initiative funded by the Save the Redwoods League in San Francisco. The measurements of the president, reported in the current National Geographic, dispelled the previous notion that the big trees grow more slowly in old age. It means, the experts say, the amount of carbon dioxide they absorb during photosynthesis continues to increase over their lifetimes. In addition to painstaking measurements of every branch and twig, the team took 15 half centimeter wide core samples of the president to determine its growth rate which they learned was stunted in the abnormally cold year of 1580 when temperatures in the Sierra hovered near freezing even in the summer and the trees remained dormant. But that was an anomaly. Sillett said, the president adds about one cubic meter of wood a year during its short six-month growing season, making it one of the fastest growing trees in the world. 
Its 2 billion leaves are thought to be the most of any tree on the planet, which would also make it one of the most efficient at transforming carbon dioxide into nourishing sugars during photosynthesis. We're not going to save the world with any one strategy, but part of the value of these great trees is this contribution and we're trying to get a handle on the math behind that," Sillet said. After the equivalent of 32 working days dangling from ropes in the president, Sillet's team is closer to having a mathematical equation to determine its carbon conversion potential. As it has done with some less famous coastal redwoods, the team has analyzed a representative sample that can be used to model the capacity of the state's signature trees. More immediately, however, the new measurements could lead to a changing of the guard in the land of giant sequoias. The park would have to update signs and brochures, and someone is going to have to correct the Wikipedia entry for, list of largest giant sequoias, which still has the president at number 3. Now at 93 feet in circumference and with 45,000 cubic feet of trunk volume and another 9,000 cubic feet in its branches, the tree named for President Warren G. Harding is about 15% larger than Grant, also known as America's Christmas tree. Sliced into one foot by one foot cubes, the president would cover a football field. Giant sequoias grow so big and for so long because their wood is resistant to the pests and disease that dwarf the lifespan of other trees. And their thick bark makes them impervious to fast-moving fire. It's that resiliency that makes sequoias and their taller coastal redwood cousin worthy of intensive protections and even candidates for cultivation to pull carbon from an increasingly warming atmosphere. Sillet said, unlike white firs, which easily die and decay to send decomposing carbon back into the air, rot-resistant redwoods stay solid for hundreds of years after they fall. Though sequoias are native to California, early settlers traveled with seedlings back to the British Isles and New Zealand, where a 15-foot diameter sequoia that is the world's biggest planted tree took root in 1850. Part of Sillet's studies involves modeling the potential growth rate of cultivated sequoia forests to determine over time how much carbon sequestering might increase. All of that led him to a spot 7,000 feet high in the Sierra and to the president, which he calls the ultimate example of a giant sequoia, compared to the other giants whose silhouettes are bedraggled by lightning strikes. The president's crown is large with burly branches that are themselves as large as tree trunks. The world's biggest tree is still the nearby General Sherman with about 2,000 cubic feet more volume than the president, but to Sillet it's not a contest. They're all superlative in their own way, Sillet said. The city of Teotihuacan, which lay about 50 kilometers northeast of modern-day Mexico City, began its growth by 200 to 100 BC. At its height, between about AD 150 and 700, it probably had a population of more than 125,000 people and covered at least 20 square kilometers. It had over 2,000 apartment complexes, a great market, a large number of industrial workshops, an administrative center, a number of massive religious edifices, and a regular grid pattern of streets and buildings. Clearly, much planning and central control were involved in the expansion and ordering of this great metropolis. Moreover, the city had economic and perhaps religious contacts with most parts of Mesoamerica, modern Central America and Mexico. How did this tremendous development take place? And why did it happen in the Teotihuacan Valley? Among the main factors are Teotihuacan's geographic location on a natural trade route to the south and east of the Valley of Mexico. The obsidian resources in the Teotihuacan Valley itself, and the valley's potential for extensive irrigation. The exact role of other factors is much more difficult to pinpoint, for instance. Teotihuacan's religious significance as a shrine, the historical situation in and around the Valley of Mexico toward the end of the first millennium BC. 
the ingenuity and foresightedness of Teotihuacan's elite, and, finally, the impact of natural disasters, such as the volcanic eruptions of the late 1st millennium BC. This last factor is at least circumstantially implicated in Teotihuacan's rise. Prior to 200 BC, a number of relatively small centers coexisted in and near the Valley of Mexico. Around this time, the largest of these centers, Quiquilco, was seriously affected by a volcanic eruption, with much of its agricultural land covered by lava. With Quiquilco eliminated as a potential rival, any one of a number of relatively modest towns might have emerged as a leading economic and political power in central Mexico. The archaeological evidence clearly indicates, though, that Teotihuacan was the center that did arise as the predominant force in the area by the 1st century AD. It seems likely that Teotihuacan's natural resources, along with the city elite's ability to recognize their potential, gave the city a competitive edge over its neighbors. The valley, like many other places in Mexican and Guatemalan highlands, was rich in obsidian. The hard volcanic stone was a resource that had been in great demand for many years. At least since the rise of the Olmecs, a people who flourished between 1200 and 400 BC, and it apparently had a secure market. Moreover, Recent research on obsidian tools found at Olmec sites has shown that some of the obsidian obtained by the Olmecs originated near Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan obsidian must have been recognized as a valuable commodity for many centuries before the great city arose. Long-distance trade in obsidian probably gave the elite residents of Teotihuacan access to a wide variety of exotic goods, as well as a relatively prosperous life. Such success may have attracted immigrants to Teotihuacan. In addition, Teotihuacan's elite may have consciously attempted to attract new inhabitants. It is also probable that as early as 200 BC, Teotihuacan may have achieved some religious significance and its shrine or shrines may have served as an additional population magnet. Finally, the growing population was probably fed by increasing the number and size of irrigated fields. The picture of Teotihuacan that emerges is a classic picture of positive feedback among obsidian mining and working, trade, population growth, irrigation, and religious tourism. The thriving obsidian operation, for example, would necessitate more miners, additional manufacturers of obsidian tools, and additional traders to carry the goods to new markets. All this led to increased wealth, which in turn would attract more immigrants to Teotihuacan. The growing power of the elite, who controlled the economy, would give them the means to physically coerce people to move to Teotihuacan and serve as additions to the labor force. More irrigation works would have to be built to feed the growing population. And this resulted in more power and wealth for the elite.